Um, so yeah, so I'm Michael Lee, and I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story about the triumph over adversity. It's a story about equality of opportunity and the state of opportunity in America. But most of all, it's a story about data. And in order to tell you the story, I have to tell you a little bit about myself and the company, but I promise you there is a story. Um, and I'm a recovering academic, uh, no offense to Jan, uh, who I think is also here in the audience. Um, and sort of through my rehab, I worked as a quant um, at DE Shaw and actually even here at Bloomberg. Uh, and then I became a data scientist at uh, Andreessen and most recently at Foursquare. And uh, then a little while ago, I decided that I wanted to start a company. Um, uh, it's a six-week fellowship. We help prepare uh, PhDs and master students. We're now accepting master students in case people were paying attention to us earlier. Uh, and we help prepare them for uh, careers in uh, data science uh, and being a quant. Uh, and we sort of think of this as both training for PhDs, so we're really trying to get them uh, familiar with a lot of the modern uh, tools like MapReduce or Spark or Random Forests. Uh, but we also think of it as a filter. So uh, we offer the training for free. And because it's free, uh, we had over 1,000 applicants um, just from PhDs. And uh, we're able to sort of choose amongst them to find the best. And then the question arose, how should we choose people? What should we do to go about uh, making that selection process? And uh, that's where the story comes in. And the story is actually about the Juilliard blind audition study. So in the 70s and 80s, uh, women accounted for less than 5% of all musicians in professional symphony orchestras. And there was this allegation of bias that, I mean, there were more uh, women auditioning for these positions than were getting in. And there was this, uh, this allegation of bias that the committees, which were primarily dominated by men at this time, uh, they had a hard time seeing a woman as someone who could sort of sit up on stage and perform as part of a professional symphony orchestra. So uh, to combat this, or to at least see if this is a factor, what they decided to do was run an experiment. Um, they put down curtains between the auditioner and the, uh, and the judge. And when they started doing that, they found that the results were astounding. There was a seven-fold increase in the uh, number of women who uh, made it uh, past that uh, screening process. And the percentage of women who were playing in these orchestras went from 5% to 25% uh, in under a decade. And so how does this apply to us? Well, when we look to hire people, uh, we, we're really making a lot of kind of subjective judgments. Uh, we look at people's resumes and we make a lot of these snap judgments that are maybe not that different from the snap judgments that the auditioners uh, at these music uh, auditions were doing. Um, and it can, might not be something as pernicious as uh, race or sex. Uh, it could be something like where you went to school, or where did you work for previously, or even something as silly as, hey, are you from Boston, and are you a Red Sox fan, right? Like, all these things play a factor in who we decide to hire. But we wanted to really move beyond that. We really wanted to get away from that. And we wanted to make this a much more data-driven process. So instead of sort of using, doing, doing the usual thing of reading the tea leaves and people's resumes, we decided to issue challenge questions. And these challenge questions kind of combine what we think of as the three building blocks of data science, uh, which are this, what did I just do? I have no idea. Okay, clearly I can't use technology. Um, but it really combines these kind of three building blocks of data science. So engineering, uh, math and stat statistics, and a little bit of kind of common sense business, uh, business sense. Uh, and to give you some sense of what these questions are like, uh, I'm going to sort of say a little bit about how maybe people did on these uh, questions. And one th question that we like to ask was something along the lines of, do you, can you program or do you know how to program in Python? And when you ask people this question, uh, about a half of them will sort of list that on the resume. Hey, I know how to program in Python. 
Um, about a third of them, when you actually ask them, here's a coding challenge. Why don't you uh, write this down? And this is a coding challenge that kind of perhaps lends itself more to a scripting language than uh, many of the other languages people chose to use. Only about a third of them actually sort of felt, I guess, felt comfortable enough that they wrote that program in Python. And then when you sort of drill down to it, only about a quarter of them got it right. And then only about an eighth, let's say, um, so half the people who got it right really got it right in a way that made you confident about the way they coded. And for the people in the room who are programmers, basically the question uh, required a little, amount of, a little bit of recursion. Um, it turns out that you can write recur it never even occurred to me, but you can write recursion by saying function one calls function two, function two calls function three, function three calls function four, and you knew because of the way the structure of the problem it would stop after ten. So you could do that and every you know write the body of the function the same way and just use copy and paste and. Uh, be creative, but I think many people here would probably get yelled at in their coding reviews if they did that. I know I certainly would have if I did that at Foursquare. Um, so you know, so, so there's this kind of hierarchy of what people know, and on the math and stats side, sort of similar things, right? So, an example of a question we might ask is sort of roughly speaking, do you know linear regression? Seventy-three percent of people claim they know it. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, about fifty percent of people. Um, Actually, uh, when you ask them a sort of an analysis question, uh, uh, roughly speaking, a machine learning question that requires that, uh, requires some form of regression analysis, only about half of people actually mention any sort of regression analysis. And the very bottom, 22%, uh, it turns out this question was about some sort of periodic data. So uh, about, ha about half of these people who sort of talk about using regression analysis talk about saying, well, I'm going to sort of extrapolate a linear trend from the last few days and go forward. And that, as it turns out, really doesn't work. If you've ever kind of done modeling, it um, doesn't really work that well. Uh, what people should really be doing, um, and what's probably taught less in schools, is this notion of I have a bunch of different uh, signals that I'm generating, and I need to use linear regression to determine how, many, how much weight to give to each signal. And only about, a, uh, I guess it would be a quarter of all people, about ha um, actually got that. So I think we sort of give interesting questions and Hopefully you're convinced of that. Uh, but I wanted to give you some, maybe some statistics that might be useful for you in your hiring. So one interesting uh, fact what we found is like what, look at language choice. So look at what people you, what language people code their answers in, and let's see how well they do on that question. So the dotted line represents uh, mi the middle, median, uh, or no, the mean. Sorry. Uh, and you can see that people who did Python, if you can read the access set, they do something about 12% better than uh, average. And the people who are doing MATLAB, sorry for all your MATLAB folks out there, you're about 17% worse. Um, uh, and R is sort of somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I think this kind of, uh, this fact kind of illustrates some of the things that we've always thought about data science, which is a lot of it is not really driven around uh, kind of having the best algorithm, which uh, you know, arguably R and MATLAB have uh, better libraries of algorithms. But a lot of data science is really just like data munging, and Python is actually a better language for that. Um, you can see, sort of see this in the data, and also if you've programmed in all three of these languages, I think you would agree that Python might, might sort of, because it's sort of integrated in this general ecosystem of uh, technology, is a little better for that. Um, Another popular thing people look at are universities, right? Like, hey, you went to a really good school. You must be smart. Um, uh, speaking as somebody who went to a really good school, that's not true. Uh, you can go look up what school I went to, and maybe you'll form negative opinions of that school. Uh, but so we, we looked at people who went to top 20 schools versus people who went to all other schools. And you can see it's only about a 5% improvement. So it's actually not a very predictive signal. Um, Perhaps a better signal is what degrees people got. So here's the distribution of degrees. And you can so it's sort of, you know, it's a lot of the usual suspects. Uh, math, computer science, physics, they tend to do well. Uh, people who did chemistry, biology, uh, psychology, they tend to do a little worse. OK, but I think there's one interesting fact here, which is economics. Uh, it's in, this, in our set, it's done better than computer science and physics. And I think that's something that it's kind of been an underappreciated discipline in this area. Uh, economics is actually uh, economics and social science is actually getting increasingly more quantitative, increasingly more data driven. And you have people who spend their entire PhD kind of wrangling data and dealing with data. Maybe not big data, but at least they have that kind of experience. Um, and what's 
not really captured in this graph is this is sort of just testing their technical skills and we're seeing that they're actually technically very strong. But economists and social scientists get a lot of training around articulating um, complex ideas. So they're very used to taking a very fuzzy question, turning that into some sort of math and computer science that they can answer with a computer and a little data science, and then uh, converting that back into words that a non-data expert can understand. And so we love economists. If there are economists in the room, please apply. Or if there are social scientists in the room, please apply. Um, but we really love them. Our employers really love them. And I think that there's this sort of like you know, one-two punch of being technically strong and being able to c communicate that. Um, and then just one last slide. So we saw in the last slide that sort of math, on average, did better than uh, chemistry, let's say. So here's the distribution, the histogram of those scores. And you can kind of see that math tends to uh, skew right, and chemistry tends to skew left. But there's this whole area here, right? All these people here, these are chemists who did better than like 80% of their mathematician colleagues. And these are the people we're trying to find. The statistics say that you, know, you shouldn't expect them to do well, but they are outliers. And you know, that's the nice thing about having ground truth data is that you don't really have to machine learn anymore. You just, I don't care about any of those signals that I just told you about. I just do a simple you know, group by, select things that are bigger, and those are the people that we, uh, we look at for the data incubator. And what we're really trying to move towards is a world of uh, blind additions for data scientists. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, or you can tweet at me or tweet at the data incubator. Uh, and I may or may not have Twitter installed, so I may or may not be able to respond to you. But <laughs> All right. uh, are there any questions? Thank you. We have time for like one or two. If, uh, yes. I was, I was a little shocked to see that computer engineering was on the bottom. Any clue about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, this is always a little tough. These, uh, the disciplines are sort of self-ascribed. So in some sense, it's a fine line between computer science and computer engineering, like what you consider one and the other. Um, and for whatever reason, people who are in computer engineering sort of do a little worse. I mean, I could speculate, but I don't think it's informed speculation. There was another one. Yes. Can, can you um, talk about how you work with companies and how you place graduates from your program? Yeah, absolutely. So um, any number of ways. So it's a six-week program. Uh, we have lots of opportunities for companies to engage. And what we found is that the companies that hire, I mean, I can have an entire deck of like slides I can data I can show you about like how companies who engage with uh, students tend to be better at hiring um, and you know because I'm kind of a data nerd I collect data about how all these processes run obsessively uh, but yeah you know they're able to meet the students at uh, drinks events sort of social uh, gatherings um, their uh, hiring partner panels where they can come and speak about their company um, there are yeah there's like two or three other ways in which they can interact that I've kind of forgotten. But there's, yeah, there's lots of ways for companies to interact with fellows. If you're interested, um, go to the website or email me, and I will get you more information. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate it. Cool. You'll, you'll, you'll be here afterwards. Right? I will be here.